Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 276, featuring an interview with Mr. Ed Freeze, aka Karen's brother and Fast Eddie. Uh, you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. Uh, Ed is a huge figure in the video game and computer uh, industry. He's uh, probably best known for his time at Microsoft, but he's got a lot of other really cool stuff in his resume, including being the inventor of the famous fish aquarium uh, screensaver, uh, just to name one. Anyway, there is a ton of great stuff in this interview. So here, uh, without further ado, is Mr. Ed Freeze. All right, folks, I am here with the legendary Ed Freeze, the former vice president of game publishing at Microsoft. Uh, he's basically the guy that gave the thumbs up and down to uh, the Xbox titles and played a huge role in creating the, the Xbox. Is that right? Does that sound about right? <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> The, the older I get, the more legendary I get. I noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know you're a pretty eclectic guy. I was looking uh, on your LinkedIn profile, see you've done some. You're on all sorts of boards of directors. You're yeah, I, uh, I Pacific keep Science Center, Z2 Live, Exponential Entertainment. I even saw something about ancient Egyptian research. Yeah, I'm What's into that What's that one about? Sure. I haven't heard any heard you talk about that. Any. <laughs> I can talk about it. You want me to talk about it now? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I love ancient Egypt, so it might be not quite right? game-related, but we, I, I just have to go there. So <laughs> uh, what's going yeah, on with that? I, it's just an area of interest of mine. I, I started going to Egypt. Uh, I probably made my first trip uh, almost 20 years ago. And uh, when I was working on Xbox, a guy in my group noticed that I was uh, – part of a local Egyptian society and he uh, met with me and said oh he knows this guy named Mark Lehner who's excavating the city of the builders of the pyramids and would I be interested in meeting him so I'm like sure I'd love to meet the guy and uh, anyway through that relationship got to know Mark got to go out visit his site uh, in Giza at the base of the pyramids and uh, joined his board and have been part of supporting his work for the last decade or so in fact supposed to talk to him later today on the phone. Oh, cool. Um, Have there but, been any uh, exciting discoveries made in the Egyptian research lately? Or? Incredibly exciting, actually. Right. Yeah, they just discovered a port on the Red Sea, and it has a set of storage bins, and these, these are huge, like rock-cut kind of tomb-like things, and jammed into the they haven't been disturbed for 4,000 years and jammed into the rocks that that block these rooms they found papyrus of the logbook of a guy who was around he was a captain of a ship at the time of the building of the pyramids and he talks about bringing blocks into the harbor uh, at, at Giza and all this stuff anyway a bunch of it's not even published yet but um, but it, it's very relevant to Mark's work because he's just, he's basically figuring out that the place he discovered at the base of the pyramids is actually a harbor town, and, um, and at least this is his theory. So, anyway, very interesting stuff. I'm guessing there's no mention of extraterrestrials or time gates. <laughs> no, we tend to stick to the facts. All right, so I was looking into your your early history. Ed, and how yeah. your, your, your dad was, a, I guess, worked at Boeing. Was he an engineer there? He was, electrical engineer, yeah. You guys were flying remote control airplanes? That sounds like <laughs> a lot of Did you watch my dice talk? Did you watch my talk at dice? Oh, yeah, I saw all kinds of stuff. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did a It wasn't fun hard talk. to find lots of information about you. <laughs> I did a fun talk uh, with about my dad at dice this year and uh, encouraged people to go watch it on YouTube. It's easy to find. Uh, I talk. I, I talk at the end about crashing one of his airplanes. It's kind of a dramatic moment for me. I noticed uh, you played lots of uh, games like Space Invaders and Space Wars, Centipede at the arcades. Is that your first brush with video games, or was it the playing adventure in Zork on the with this terminal that your mom brought home? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm, I talk about my dad. I need to do a talk about my mom now to balance it yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, the mom too. We got we, Maybe we could do that here. So, what, where does the <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's my mom's mom influence? Was, 
she was she met my dad in college. Uh, they went to Bucknell University together and uh, met in college. Both moved out here to work for Boeing. She was a mechanical engineer. And so she worked there for a while and then uh, quit to have the kids. Went back to college, uh, went to the University of Washington here to get a master's in computer science. And so she was one of the really early women to get a degree in computer science. And I definitely tagged along with her as a kid down at the University of Washington and watched her submit her batch jobs on punch cards and, and uh, all that stuff. So, you know, between the two of them, they were always bringing technology home. Dad would bring home programmable calculators. There's a, something yeah, I noticed that you, you had a collection of those, right? <laughs> Yeah, I do. Uh, there's something called the HP 65, which was an early programmable calculator that was ridiculously expensive. I mean, you had to be somebody like Boeing to afford it. But he could bring it home some nights, and it had a little mag tape that you would put in, and you could store a couple hundred bytes of uh, instructions on it. And so that was one of the first things I programmed was made a little blackjack program for that machine. But yeah, mom would bring home a printing terminal. Mom would bring home a printing terminal, and we would. It know. is for people that don't know what that means. I feel like I know <laughs> what it means, but just can you describe what it was like playing these games on a printing terminal? So a printing terminal has no screen. Uh, screens were big and expensive and heavy. Um, it, it's just a printer and a keyboard. Um, and so anything you typed on the keyboard, it, it would it would print character by character. Just like you were typing on a typewriter. Do I have to explain what a typewriter is, too? <laughs> no. I... <laughs> Maybe. We'll give them anyway. the benefit of a doubt. <laughs> but uh, so this thing, it looked basically like a printer with a keyboard attached. And then there was a big phone cradle. So you would dial up to the computer and you would hear the tone. And then you'd stick the phone in the cradle and it would connect through a modem. And then you're basically talking to a mainframe computer. And. Um, and yeah, and then you would just type. So games like Zork, you know, the original text adventures worked great in that sort of situation. You would just type what you wanted, and then it would print out the next few lines. And uh, what was great, at the end, you had this huge pile of paper on the floor. You could go back and relive your whole experience, you know, because it was all documented there for you. Wow. Just imagine <laughs> it must have printed that line about not understanding your input about 10 billion <laughs> times. Time. Exactly. Lost in a maze of twisty little passages all like over and over again. I was noticed that I was really happy. I was looking at some of your earlier interviews and I saw one where you said that your favorite game of all time is Mule. You know, it's also one of my favorites. So. Ah, good. Yeah, I played that. It seems like, you know, a lot of our personal stories are, are the same. I remember with that one, I played that with my mom and dad all the time, too. And it ah. sounds like you played it the same way with your family. Now you're passing it on to, to your kids, right? Yeah, you know, most, back then, uh, I couldn't get my brother or sister to play. I'd play with a couple friends. Oh. And, and uh, we like to play with three people and uh, one Mectron, so one, one AI-controlled player. And that's because the Mectrons were dumb and they did, you know, they, they would mine all the smith ore we needed and then we could battle for the Christite. So it was, uh, we had many, many long, fun late-night games at that game. It's, uh, you know, created by the famous designer Dan Bunton, became Danny Bunton, um, and definitely one of, one of the best game designers of all time, in my opinion, and one of the best games of all time. And a game that doesn't really exist today. I mean, there isn't a modern equivalent of Mule. People have tried to make kind of modern copies and uh, it never works out. So, I don't know. Great game, as you know. Yes, it's one of those games where it's it's kind of harder to, to pinpoint exactly what it is that makes it so good. I mean, it's got a really it's really fun multiplayer, but there's got to me there's sort of an aesthetic, a humor to it that just uh, haven't seen in any anything else. I think there's also um, a really nice balance of skill and randomness that um, really adds to the gameplay. Uh, you know, skill matters, but still, random things can happen and screw you up and uh, it's it's nice to remember that when you're making games that you want you want some amount of randomness like and it's true in card games for example I mean skill matters but then there's just the way the cards land too and the, that combination of those two things I think really adds to the fun. So I, is this correct that your first game was a Frogger clone named Froggy? <laughs> 
That was the first game I did that was published. Is that, is that still around? Can we? Is it? Yeah, yeah, you can find no, it. You can Go find to it. AtariMania.com. You know, got all my old stuff up there. Um, so uh, the deal was when I was going into high school, uh, the first personal computers were starting to come out TRS 80, Apple II, uh, you know, PET, Commodore PET, that kind of thing. We had Apple IIs at our school. They bought Apple IIs right as I was going into high school, which was great because they were the best machines you could get at that time. And so I started to program those in BASIC. And then, um, and then one Christmas, must have been Christmas of 81 or so, uh, under the Christmas tree there was an Atari 800. And at first I was disappointed because I wanted an Apple II, right? That's what I had been working on at school and stuff. But the more I learned about the machine, the more I, I really fell in love with it. And there's a much better machine for video games. Uh, probably piss off some of your Apple II fans on that when I say that. But I mean, it had built-in sprites and oh, sure. actual actual colors, not just <laughs> not just sort of a purple and a blue you could get by lighting every other pixel on the Apple II. <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, that's really when I realized I was going to be a programmer and fell in love with programming, but I, I didn't really know what to write. I mean, what kind of game should I write? So I started imitating things I saw in the arcade. And uh, one of the first things I did was actually a Space Wars clone. So I did a, I did a version of Space Wars. Um, I needed a square root routine to do the gravity around the sun. I needed an assembly language square root routine. And I there was no internet back then. How do you find something like that? I went, I went to the library and looked up in the card catalog and somehow found a magazine with the article about a 6502 square root routine, which was written by this guy named Waz. <laughs> that Waz, yeah. And so anyway, so that was actually one of the first assembly language games I did. I did, I did Froggy after that. Um, and Froggy, I did, like all everything I'd done up to that point, I did for fun. And um, again, there was no internet, so there was no way for it to get around. I was just doing it for myself and for friends. But um, somebody put it on a bulletin board. You know how there were these bulletin boards all around the country, and you had to dial into them. Only one person could be connected at a time, typically. And you could, you'd, people would upload High stuff. speed, 300 baud modem. <laughs> or maybe 1200 by then, but... Yeah, 1200 was annoying because it was faster than you could read, you know, as it came in. <laughs> that 300 baud you could keep up with. But anyway, um, so it just made its way around the country. Um, and I was in high school doing this stuff for fun, working at a pizza place at night to, you know, make some money. And just one day these guys showed up from this California company called Ramox. They, and they tracked me down just based on my name on that game. It just said, wow. buy Eddie Freeze. Somehow they found the right Eddie Freeze in the country. I, I have no idea how, because, I mean, I wasn't old enough to be in the phone book. Um, so, but somehow they found me. And, we, need um, you to, <laughs> we need you to come sit inside this limo, huh? <laughs> well, <laughs> must have been yeah, a little bit like, scary, huh? It was exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, the idea that somebody wanted to pay me for doing what I was doing for fun. It's a good thing, you know? So uh, I agreed to uh, modify that game. They were afraid we were going to get sued. And, uh, yeah, Frogger, was... Froggy. Uh, <laughs> it's just coincidence, right? <laughs> it was an exact clone uh, of Frogger. And so we made this game. So they... There, I got it right here. Uh so they had the idea, I don't know if you can see that, so it's... Princess and Frog. Princess Romox. and Frog. So their idea was to change the, um, that's really small for you, change the uh, cars into jousting knights and make it kind of a medieval theme. Ah, so clever. There was still a frog, he still crossed a road, and there was still a river that had crocodiles. Everything else was basically the same, but now the cars became jousting knights. And then on the other side, instead of jumping on a, on, a, on a fly, you jumped on, it was supposed to be a princess, like you were kissing a princess and then uh, you became a prince. But I couldn't really draw the princess, so I just drew a big pair of lips. <laughs> <laughs> you just jump on the pair of lips. 
And uh, anyway, that was Princess and Frog. Um, so I did that game. And that's for how them. you made your first million. Yeah, right. Now, not <laughs> <laughs> not a million, uh, but I made enough to uh, help you know pay for going to college. Um, so I, I was going to college by then, uh, 1982. I graduated high school and went to college, uh, and. So I did that game. I did two more games for them, a game called Ant Eater, and then a game called Sea Chase. And I was working on a fourth game. And um, it was 1984, and all of a sudden the calls stopped coming. And they were just gone. And I, I was going to a little college in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico, so I didn't really know what was going on. But what was going on was, as you know, the meltdown of the entire video game industry in 1984. So... That was uh, that was the end of my first career in the video game business. Yeah, I was reading about how you learned how to program. You mentioned the magazine that you found, but I, I seem to remember you saying somewhere that you also typed in lots of games from. I don't know, you know the magazine, computer magazines back then had the, the source code you could just type in. Yeah. And like yeah, I remember, I had the same memory of, of you. If you you could type in all this stuff, and if you had one character off. <laughs> You, know, you talk to just about anybody of my era, and we all did that. You know, these magazines like Antic or Creative C Computing would come out, and they would have games in them, and you would type them in, and hopefully some of it would rub off on you. You know, some of it, you'd start to understand how a game was structured and, um, you know, how to, how to build a decent game. Um, but it was super tedious and, um, and easy to make mistakes. I actually wrote a program to help me type in the programs. <laughs> So I could hit, you know, a single letter and it would type out a whole basic keyword and that made it a little faster for me to type them in. Uh, but it was, I'm not sure it actually helped that much, but it just gave me another, another program to write. I, I wrote lots of little games in basic before I started programming in assembly language. I wrote a game to play, the card game Gin. I wrote a, I wrote a robot combat game that me and my friends had a lot of fun with where you'd program little robots and they would go around and battle. Um, and uh, the robots had their own kind of assembly language that you'd program them in. And, uh, anyway, it was just, just whatever, I could, whatever I could think of to program. Um, this was all on the Atari 800? All on the Atari, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you got your money's worth out of that. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty much high school for me. I was in the basement. <laughs> having fun. Why did you end up at Microsoft? And was it 1986? Yeah, I was actually first there in 85, in the 85. summer of 85. Um, so uh, after the video game business melted down, so summer of 84, when I came home from college, I looked for a summer job. And um, I got a job at a little company called Starcom working on this database program called Files and Folders. But when I went around that summer to interview for jobs, um, everybody I talked to asked if I was also interviewing at Microsoft. And I hadn't really thought about Microsoft. It was, I mean, I knew they made a mouse in <laughs> basic, but that's pretty much all I knew about the company at the time. It, it was a pretty small company. Um, but they're in my, you know, my hometown. I grew up in Bellevue, Washington, which is right next to Redmond, Washington. Um, anyway, um, so the next summer, I sent a resume to Microsoft, and um, they apparently liked my resume because they flew me up for spring break, which is exciting as a kid. I <laughs> got to get to fly home for uh, spring break uh, and interview, long interview. And, and anyway, they offered me a job. And so, um, yeah, so summer of 85, I worked as a summer intern. That's the year before the company went public. Uh, it was about 800 people at the company at that time, and I worked in a group called the, uh, the User Assistance Group, or the CBT Group, Computer Based Training Group, working on tutorials to teach people how to use Microsoft products. Mm -hmm. And even then you were trying to find little subtle ways to work in some, some gaming and humor and stuff. <laughs> You've done your homework, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean... I, you know, I, by then I had a history in games and I, I liked games. Uh, you know, I didn't just program games. I loved playing games, play games all the time. But, um, yeah, so I was working one day. The artists in the group that I worked in would build, um, 
they build tutorials for things like Microsoft MultiPlan, which is Microsoft's first spreadsheet. Um, and they would, the tutorials, they, they were character based because the applications were character based. So they would make things out of slashes and asterisks and stuff like that, but they'd make whole scenes. And one day one of the artists walked into my office and said she was making a, uh, a dentist's office. And um, she wanted to, because every dentist's office has a fish tank, she wanted to have a fish tank in the office. And could I add, could I make it so that fish would swim in a little tank on the screen, which was not a capability of the system at that time. And I said, sure, I can do that. So I added this little animation system. The artists were really fun to work with because they were, were not technical. So everything I did was like magic to them. So they were, I, I was like this wizard, you know, <laughs> down the hall from them who could make things happen. And uh, they thought I did things pretty fast. So they, they started calling me Fast Eddie. Fast <laughs> Eddie. <laughs> Which unfortunately is not a nickname that stuck. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so this artist, Janet Vogelzang, was like, can you make a way to animate these fish? And so uh, I said, sure. And I said, but also if you give me more fish, if you make me some bigger fish, I have this other idea I want to do. And so she made some bigger fish. And I read, wrote a separate uh, program that just made fish swim back and forth on the screen. I didn't really think anything of it. I just did it one day as a, for fun. And, um, you know, I started to go home at night and I start to see it running on more and more people's screens at night. And people started using it as a screensaver. I mean, it must have been one of the first screensavers, you know, uh, which was not my intention at all. I was just making some fish swim on the screen. But then that, that actually ended up creating this whole other branch of my life where it's like, uh, I ended up making a Windows version of Fish and then a Macintosh version of Fish. And me and this other guy started a little shareware company where we sold this Fish screensavers. Our fish, we did the Fish screensaver that was in Berkeley Systems After Dark, the thing with the flying toasters, all that. Yeah, my grandmother's so, going to be so happy to talk to you because <laughs> when she got her new computer, and the first thing she wanted was the Fish screensaver. And somehow, I guess you could still buy this as a separate, like in the box, you know, from the. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Right. She, so, she so loves that one there. Whole other way I influenced the world, <laughs> in a positive way, I guess. But anyway, so yeah, I so I finished my internship in 1985. Um, I had a pretty good reputation in the company, and so they offered me a full-time job when I graduated the next year. Um, and uh, they told me I could either they called me up and they said they can't decide what project to put me on. Either they're going to put me on an old project or a new project. And I said, oh well. That's all they said, an old one or a new one. And I said, well, the new one sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> new is good, right? <laughs> right. And uh, they called me back a few weeks later and they said, uh, no, it doesn't look like the new one. We got, we're not going to have room for you on the new one. We're going to put you on the old one instead. Was it Microsoft Bob, was it? <laughs> no, that was actually done by my twin sister, but that's a whole other story. Oh. Um, Your twin, you had a twin sister working at Microsoft at the same time? All right, I'll tell I'll tell that story in a sec. Let me finish the okay, story, okay. then I'll, t I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you how my sister, brother, and mother all ended up working at the company. <laughs> um, so, anyway, um, <laughs> so they call me back a few weeks later and they say we couldn't put you on the new one. We're going to put you on the old one. Well, the new one turned out to be Microsoft Works, which was kind of a cut down productivity thing. And the old one was Microsoft Excel, um, which is actually a much more interesting project to work on. And, um, and it was old because a Macintosh version had been released and they were working on the first version for Windows. So I became the seventh programmer working on the first version of Excel for Windows. And that was the start of my career at Microsoft. Really great, great project to be on. So, uh, should we take a detour about my family at Microsoft? Sure. Yeah, I didn't even know you had a twin sister. Yeah, I try to keep it quiet. <laughs> so, so growing up, I have a brother who's just 14 months older than me, and then I have a twin sister. So we we were all really close in age, and um, I grew up in a very technical family. Like I talked about, my mom was mechanical engineer slash computer science. My dad was a electrical engineer. My brother got a degree in electrical engineering like my dad and I got a degree in computer science like my mom. Um, 
my sister was always the black sheep. She was not the technical one. She didn't want to be a technical person. She was a cheerleader in high school, that kind of thing. Um, and so uh, I went off to get my computer science degree. My brother went off to get his electrical engineering degree. She went to the University of Washington to get a degree in business and psychology. Okay, nothing to do with technology. I'm the only programmer in the family. I get a job at Microsoft. It's like, ah, so nice because when you're working, when you, when you have kids in your family that are this so, so close to you in age, all through school, it's like, oh, you're Karen's brother or, oh, you're Bob's brother or whatever. And it's like, no, I'm me. I'm not, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. It gets annoying after a while, especially when you're a twin. So anyway, it was so nice to be off at my own company, creating my own sort of future. And um, my sister graduated a year after I did because she got two degrees, one in business and one in psychology, and she wanted to be a recruiter. And she was immediately hired by Microsoft as a campus recruiter. So all of a sudden, my sister's at my company, even though she has nothing to do with programming. Oh, no. Oh, it was so bad. I come in one day and... Um, and my nameplate, one of the things that was great about working at Microsoft at that time was one of the perks as a programmer was everyone got their own private office with a door that shut, name on the door. And uh, I, come to, I come to work one day and my nameplate has been changed. And instead of saying Ed Freeze, it says Karen's brother. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> totally got me. Totally got me. So, and who did that? So I, some of these. Yeah. Must have oh, been a lot of pranksters sister. there at the Microsoft. Oh, I, many pranks. I could talk about pranks <laughs> for an hour. But anyway, they love to do pranks on me for whatever reason. But I think I'll redo um, the intro and introduce you as Karen's brother. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. Please don't. So anyway, Karen had an interesting career because she went into recruiting and she moved from there to marketing. And she moved from marketing to program management. She uh, worked on a product called Publisher with uh, Melinda, who became Melinda Gates. Uh, so um, she's close with the Gates. Um, and when she was on Publisher, she invented the kind of wizard interface. And so the, the funny thing about her not being a technical person is she was always kind of saying, we need to make this stuff easier to use and inventing stuff for like real people to use the software instead of programming geeks like me. Um, and so for, after that project, she went on to work on Bob. And Bob was supposed to be the operating system for everyone, you know, the thing that was not designed by programmers, but by real people. Mm. And, uh, well, that didn't really work <laughs> out. <laughs> <did it>? <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of a dark chapter in our family history, but anyway. But uh, then she went from there to work on research. She did a bunch of search technology stuff for Microsoft. She's actually the person responsible also for Clippy, the Clippy, the little oh, uh, Clippy. paper clip. I was, also sort and of you tainted. never let her forget it. <laughs> <laughs> she's uh yeah so but anyway now we we get along pretty well um and uh so uh, meanwhile my brother went to work at the same company as my mom digital equipment corporation or deck and um so he's working as an electrical engineer for deck and there's a guy over there named dave cutler dave is a famous famous operating system designer for digital for many, many years. And he was running this research group out here in, in Seattle. And um, for whatever reason, he gets fed up with DEC and he decides to defect and come over to Microsoft. And um, so he comes over to Microsoft and ends up building Windows NT, which is sort of the basis of the modern versions of Windows. But when he came over, he brought about 30 people with him. And my brother was one of them. And um, so by the end of 1988, um, my twin sister and my brother are all working at the same company as me. Uh, I worked there until 2004. My sister quit in about 2008, and my brother still works there today. So, yeah, that's the freezes at Microsoft. My mom later retired from DEC and and went to work for a technical writing company, and they farmed her out to Microsoft, too. So for a short period of time, four of the five freezes were at Microsoft. So it's a good time. And the 
that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part two. A lot of great stuff coming up from uh, Mr. Uh, Freeze. We're just barely uh, getting started here. I think I got about almost two hours worth of footage with him. Uh, so lots of great stuff. Stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you very, very much if you have supported the show. It uh, really, really means a lot to me, guys. Thank you so much for that. Uh, if you would like to support the show, uh, just follow the links in the show notes to my Patreon site. You can sign up for whatever amount you want, and that will give you access to some special podcasts and the Google Air Hangouts, uh, which are always lots of fun. So, hope to see you guys soon. Uh, what about the news from the Matt Cave? I got some uh, really good stuff here. Uh, first of all, uh, Pulver Congen uh, wrote in to tell me about a... There's a video up with uh, John Romero playing his own Levels of Doom uh, with some running commentary. I think they might have used Twitch for that. Uh, but anyway, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. I think you guys would like to uh, check that out. Uh, the really big news, though... Uh, actually, Becky, uh, Bar- Becky Berger Heineman wrote in uh, to tell me about this. I should have seen the announcement. Somehow I missed it. Uh, but anyway, Brian Fargo, a familiar name to uh, Matt Chatters, has announced a, an official sequel to the Bard's Tales. This will be Bard's Tale 4. Uh, and it's not going to be like his, uh, his, his own Bard's Tale game, the sort of humor, satire thing. It's going to be a you know, full-on, proper sequel to this uh, really great franchise. And uh, I guess this is still... I, don't, hardly, I wasn't able to get many details at all about this other than that I guess it's going to be Kickstarter funded. You know, it's a no-brainer there. I'll be definitely uh, supporting that. I'm trying to get Brian on the show, too, to talk about it. Uh, but also, uh, Becky uh, wanted us uh, to let Brian know that uh, you know she's very interested. Of course, she did uh, Bard's Tales uh, one through three. She was involved in all those, and uh, especially uh, the, the uh, third Bard's Tale. And she'd like to be involved in Bard's Tale four, uh, which <laughs> and that, that'd be a wonderful thing. Also, uh, Janelle Jakeways and uh, Susan Manley, uh, both people who have been on the show, uh, apparently they're all interested. So let's try to uh, let Brian know that. Uh, he should, uh, you know, see if they see if they can work something out where they can be part of this uh, amazing uh, Bard's Tale Four uh, uh, sequel. All right, I think that's going to do it for the news. Uh, oh, uh, one more thing. Uh, as we get closer to uh, Match Hat 300, I think it's about time that I redid my channel trailer uh, something a little better. Uh, some people I think have rightfully criticized the current trailer because it's uh, doesn't really talk enough about the interviews, doesn't have any segments of my uh, interviews that would be uh, sort of good for new people to see what all the, uh, basically what the show is about. I was thinking, uh, so basically what I would like is uh, for you to, uh, you know, send me some tips or a list of uh, favorite moments or whatever uh, from the interviews that you'd like to see in there. And also I thought it'd be cool to have a a little segment in there where uh, people like you just say what you like about Matt Chat. You know, hi, I'm so-and-so, here's my YouTube channel. Uh, I like uh, to watch Matt Chat for blah, blah, blah. So, you know, if you want to do a little, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, you know, if you want to mention your own projects a little bit, companies, whatever, that, that's fine. Uh, but anyway, I think it'd be cool to make that a little bit more. Uh, basically, so it's not just me up there, uh, but we, you know, make a proper a proper channel trailer. So i really like to hear all of your suggestions about uh, stuff for that. <clears throat> all right, what about that ale of the week? Ah, well, uh, this week I've got an an Excelsior. I'm pretty sure I've had an Excelsior on the show before, but this is the uh, Bittenschlapp. <laughs> Bittenschlapp. I hope I haven't covered... Have I covered... Have I done this one already? Uh, I really hope not. Uh, seems like I remember that Bittenschlapp. <laughs> I should probably update my list. Uh, but anyway, this one is uh, 6.5% alcohol by volume. Uh, so very respectable brew. A medium-bodied, smooth, dark ale... Robustly malted with lots of Vienna malts, flavors of caramel, toffee, and cocoa. A Munich-inspired ale. And this is from the Excelsior Brewery right in here in uh, Minnesota. (laughs) You know, it's kind of funny. I can't even remember if I've I've tried this one before. Uh, Anyway, let me get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this bitch schlop here in the uh, rather excellent drinking horn. Been smelling this. It's uh, it smells pretty nice. You can definitely smell some uh, some uh, cherry like aromas to this. A little bit of a caramel, uh, but not a whole, not a lot of hops to this. Anyway, let's give it a try. A uh, very sweet uh, aroma to this. A lot of that uh, cherry flavor. A little bit of a scotch like uh, quality to it. It's uh, definitely not bad. Let me try it again. 
Hmm. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm tasting. It's not a really a flavorful uh, beer. You just sort of get the sort of suggestion, <laughs> uh, suggestion I suppose, of those sort of cherry, uh, toasty, uh, malty-like uh, flavors here. Let me uh, try it one more time. And overall, it's not bad. It doesn't really kick you in the face or anything. Uh, not really something I would want to have a whole six pack of though. Uh, I'm going to go uh, three out of five drinking horns on this. It's not bad. I don't really drink a lot of brown ale, so I'm not really uh, sure how to compare this one with other ones, but you know, <laughs> I think three out of five pretty much says it all. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. <clears throat> and uh, the quotation I found is from uh, Teddy, uh, aka Theodore Roosevelt, and it goes something like this. If you could kick the person in the pants responsible for most of your trouble, you wouldn't sit for a month. <laughs> See you guys next week. Well, let's say this Twinkie represents the normal amount of psychokinetic energy in the New York area.